Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, the defenestrations of Derek Sloan and Roman Baber, the bad science of lockdowns, and the financial benefit of free speech. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show on True North. Good to have you tuned in to the program on this January 19th, 2021. After we have seen now the new trend in Canadian conservative politics to throw people out summarily without so much as a thank you or goodbye. The latest example of this, of course, is Derek Sloan, the former conservative leadership candidate who yesterday was defenestrated thrown out the window of the Conservative Party by leader Aaron O'Toole for reasons that should concern anyone. Now, I want to just make something very clear here. I know there are a lot of people that aren't a fan of Derek Sloan for his social conservatism. There were people that did the whole feigning outrage thing when he took aim at Theresa Tam and were accusing him of being a racist and whatever. But even if you don't like Derek Sloan, and I've had good conversations with him, surely you can understand that the process by which he was ejected is one that was not fair and not particularly particularly just. So what happened was Press Progress, which is a far-left smear machine, put out a story yesterday saying that Sloan had received a donation from Paul Fromm. Now, Paul Fromm is not a name that most Canadians would know. He is someone that is connected with white supremacist groups, with neo-Nazi groups, and I have no hesitation saying that he is not the type of person that I would want to be connected with and not the type of person that I would want any politician to be connected with. Paul Fromm had donated $131 to uh, to Derek Sloan's leadership campaign. Donations are publicly available. You can search them. And what happened was this was leaked to Press Progress or Press Progress happened to find it. I suspect it was the former. So this comes out within hours Derek Sloan thrown out of the Conservative caucus, basically, or at least the process has commenced to do that, and barred by Aaron O'Toole from running as a Conservative in the next election for $131 from an undesirable white supremacist type. And let me tell you something here. This is, if you were to get rid of Derek Sloan for any reason, this is probably the weakest reason you could come up with. 13,000 people donated to Sloan's campaign. 13,000. A total of about $1.3 million, Derek Sloan said in a statement. So the idea that a small team of volunteers, and by the way, a lot of political outsiders, not people that know you're supposed to be on the lookout for these sorts of uh, smears in the future, were not going through line by line. And even if they were, the idea that they would recognize Paul Fromm's name when he was donating under a different name, under Frederick Fromm, and make the connection that, oh, wait, that might be a different name for this other guy who even then we had probably never heard of. So let's look this up. And and at a certain point, I, I'm just thinking, let's just get Paul Fromm to donate to Justin Trudeau, and then that's all it takes, and Justin Trudeau's gone. I mean, if that's all it takes, you just have to get this guy to give 131 bucks to someone, and that torches their political career, then have at it. I've got a whole list of people. Maybe we can Maybe we can, uh, you know, front the money depending on where we want to get directed. So my whole point here is that Derek Sloan has been kicked out for reasons that do not align with the stated reason of Aaron O'Toole, which he put in a statement yesterday. Derek Sloan's acceptance of a donation from a well-known white supremacist is far worse than a gross error of judgment or failure of due diligence. In accordance with the Reform Act, I have initiated the process to remove Mr. Sloan from the Conservative Party of Canada caucus. I expect this to be done as quickly as possible. Moreover, as leader of Canada's Conservatives, I will not allow Mr. Sloan to run as a candidate for our party. Racism is a disease of the soul, repugnant to our core values. It has no place in our country. It has no place in the Conservative Party of Canada. I won't tolerate it. 
Now, I think a condemnation of racism is completely fine. I think everyone should condemn racism when they see it and in general terms. But condemning racism in this context, is Aaron O'Toole calling Derek Sloan a racist? Is he just calling Paul Fromm a racist? Is he calling accepting a contribution racist? Because here's the thing, when, when people hear that word accepted a donation, this paints a picture that is different than how political contributions actually work. Accepted donation makes it sound like there was just this big giant check that was made out to the Derek Sloan campaign. It was presented. Derek Sloan took it, shook hands, had a photo, and that was that. When in actuality, anyone can donate to a political campaign. They go online, and in the course of the leadership race, they were processed by the Conservative Party of Canada, which took, I believe it was a 10% cut off the top. And Derek Sloan pointed out, well, hang on, the party, uh, the party has a role to play in this, which I think is actually a valid point. And what was interesting as well is that apparently Paul Fromm was a member of the Conservative Party of Canada, which means the party accepted him as a member. So this idea that all of a sudden Derek Sloan is the bad guy here, because he was the, I don't even want to say he accepted, because he was the beneficiary of $131 from this guy is pretty ridiculous. Derek Sloan put out a statement, his official statement on the events of January 18th, 2021. He said, at 4 p.m. today, I learned for the first time that an individual named Paul Fromm donated online to my leadership campaign. The donation was made in August of 2020. So that would have been the tail end of the leadership race. He talked about the fact that the uh, name was not Paul Fromm, as it appeared, but uh, Frederick P. Fromm. And then he says, we also discovered through an investigation into the voters list that the same individual under the name of Frederick P. Fromm applied to be a member of the CPC and the party accepted his application last summer. The CPC mailed a ballot to Fromm. From mailed back his ballot and the party accepted it. Moreover, even though the representatives of the campaigns of O'Toole, McKay, and Lewis all had scrutineers present, not one of the campaigns objected to his ballot, and it seems that his ballot was accepted. So if we start to, again, use the same terminology of accepted, well, why did the Conservative Party accept a ballot from this man? Mm -hmm. See, <laughs> two can play that game. He goes on, and you can read the whole statement online, but he says, uh, if the party later realized who it was and returned its share of the donation, they never told me they should have. If they did not discover this, I'm not surprised. Neither did we until this story broke earlier this afternoon. When the problematic donation was brought to my attention, I immediately asked CPC Executive Director to refund the donation. So it sounds like Sloan's campaign did exactly what it should given the circumstances. And there is a ring of truth problem here as well, because one thing that I would note is that most politicians who don't want to be associated with someone or know that someone is an undesirable would not torch their political career over $131. The price to sell one's soul is a lot more than that. So the idea that Derek Sloan took this risk took this significant risk, knowing this would all come, is a pretty ridiculous assertion. The easiest explanation, Occam's razor dictates that this guy, for whatever reason, wanted to donate to Derek Sloan's campaign, and no one knew anything other than that. When they saw the name and the donation, it was just, okay, great, another contributor, and that was that. I would support ejecting Derek Sloan from the caucus if he knew about it, but he is saying very decisively that he did not. And again, we have to ask the question of how on earth Press Progress came about this information. I have a hard time believing that they're going line by line through 13,000 donations to Derek Sloan's campaign, plus whoever donated to uh, Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole and, and Leslie Lewis. So the idea is that someone else probably did it and sent it to them. Now, maybe it was just some diehard uh, socialist. Maybe it was within the party. I don't know. I do know that Derek Fildebrandt, who is the uh, publisher of the Western Standard and a very good guy, we've talked to him on the show in the past, he's hearing from conservative MPs that they think it is an inside job. And moreover, conservative MPs who he says are planning to vote against ejecting Sloan from caucus. 
Now, at the risk of getting too into the weeds here, Derek Sloan can be barred from running by O'Toole. That's the leader's prerogative to say, you know what, I'm not certifying you as a candidate. But to remove him from the conservative caucus actually requires a vote from caucus. Now, we don't know how much the deck is stacked against him or not. Generally speaking, people don't want to go against the leader. So in that sense, it, it will probably not work out too well. But it sounds from what Derek Fildebrandt's written in this article at the Western Standard that there are at least some Ontario and Alberta Conservative MPs that are saying, you know what, I'm not exactly a fan of this, but they want a secret ballot because they don't want to have to go against their leader publicly. So they're supposed to be able to get a secret ballot, but it is not yet known whether that will materialize. Caucus meets on Wednesday, so there's still a, a little bit of time here. But again, by going after the party, by pointing out their role in this, it sounds like Derek Sloan knows that his fate is sealed. Now, there is something in this that is emerging as a part of a trend to some extent, and that is conservatives deciding to play the game on the left's turf and to play the left's game by the left's rules, which never works out well. I mean, talk to Andrew Shear about this. He and I spoke on his way out back in August, and he had said, you know what, he kind of wishes, looking back, that he had just been more authentic. He was well aware that the media was just going to hit him no matter what, so it really didn't matter all that much. Because now what the conservatives have done is said that they are going to allow a left-wing hatchet machine, a left-wing smear machine, dictate the conservative caucus. That's what they've determined, that it's the left that gets to call the shots. It's their world. We just get to live in it. And just a few days ago, Aaron O'Toole took aim at the far right, which again, Maybe a completely justifiable thing to say, except that it was done in a manner that was almost trying to grovel to the left. And it was actually quite unpleasant in that sense. He put out this statement that said, within minutes of becoming leader of Canada's conservatives, I said that I want the party to be one that welcomes all Canadians, regardless of race, religion, economic standing, education, or sexual orientation. I've said that as prime minister, I will govern on behalf of all Canadians, and so on and so forth. And he talks about being pro-choice, being pro-LGBT rights, being pro-Indigenous. And these are all things that he's been completely transparent about. But then he says this, the Conservatives are a moderate, pragmatic, mainstream party, as old as Confederation that sits squarely in the center of Canadian politics. My singular focus is to get Canada's economy back on track as quickly as possible to create jobs and a secure a strong future for all Canadians. There is no place for the far right in our party. Now, it is interesting to see how we came from in the leadership race, Aaron O'Toole as the true blue candidate to now that he's conservative leader, the conservatives being moderate and centrist. Now, I want to make a point here. There is a difference between him thinking that conservatism is naturally a centrist position versus saying the Conservative Party of Canada is a centrist, moderate party. He's saying the latter. He's saying with a capital C, the conservatives are moderate and in the center of Canadian politics. And what he's trying to do is broaden the coalition. I get it. He's trying to bring in new voters, new Canadians, suburban families. He's trying to bring in unions, people that may not have voted conservative. This has been the line we keep hearing over and over. He wants more people to look in the mirror and see a conservative. You can achieve that by one of two ways. You can... Try to just expand the party, market your conservatism, tell people, hey, that idea that they're talking about actually seems to work. Conservatives aren't scary. Or you can do what is oftentimes the instinct from conservatives, which is move yourself to where the people already are. And I get very nervous when I hear a conservative leader elected as being a true blue conservative start talking about him being the leader of a party that he sees as moderate and centrist. Because moderation and centrism are entirely justifiable political beliefs. But at a certain point, you can't straddle the center. You have to be on the left or on the right. And if the conservatives are in the center of, conserv of Canadian politics, who is on the right? We have two parties on the left, which means one of them naturally takes from the center. Who is to the right of the conservatives? Uh, certainly the People's Party, but they're a new force in Canadian politics. So if, if Aaron O'Toole is saying that from Confederation, the Conservatives are squarely in the center, who else is to the right? 
No one, absolutely no one in that context, in that way. So I'm not exactly clear what is to be celebrated about denying the conservatism of the Conservative Party of Canada. And then to make a link that we condemn the far right, okay, great. I think condemning the far right is important. I also think you should probably define the far right because we're called far right all the time at True North. Conservative politicians are called far right. So what is the far right? Is the far right anyone that is just to the right of where you think that moderate center position is? But the whole point of this statement was coming about because of a defensive response. It was coming about in a reactionary way because Candace Bergen, who's a lovely woman, the deputy leader of the conservatives, was photographed wearing a, a MAGA hat as a gag. And all of a sudden, the conservatives have to condemn the far right. Well, what is it exactly that is being condemned? Because the problem that I'm having is that once again, we are seeing the left call the shots. The left decide to launch a wave of attacks against Candace Bergen, against Aaron O'Toole. What was the other one that they did? Oh yeah, Aaron O'Toole's interview with Rebel News. That was, again, something that was forcing the conservatives to be on defense. So the leader of the official opposition's office is now condemning in general terms to a question no one is asking, the far right. So what we are seeing is the continued capitulation to the left-wing narrative. Aaron O'Toole, who by all accounts, and by the way, I've had a, a number of good interactions with him on air and off air. I've had great interviews with him. I think he was saying a lot of the right things during the leadership race. And if he can adopt the platform that he ran on in the leadership in the general, I don't think there's going to be a problem. But I, I'm seeing some things here that need to be questioned and need to be called out. And when he starts to, again, govern based on what the liberals say he needs to be doing, here's a guy who is not a fire-breathing, hard-right, far-right guy, yet he's being criticized by the left for being far-right. So now that he has to criticize the far-right himself, it becomes very circular. But him not being far-right hasn't stopped him from having to say he's not which I think is a lesson we can all learn and need to learn, and I've been talking about this for years now, about the unrelenting nature of the mainstream media, the unrelenting nature of the political left. And, you know, I was planning on talking about another defenestration on today's show before the Derek Sloan uh, defenestration happened, and, and that was that of Roman Baber, the Ontario MPP, who, again, was kicked out of the PC caucus in Ontario for daring to go against big lockdowns. Now, let me say, I, I've had a number of political disagreements with Roman Baber, and, and just personally through contacts I have in the PC caucus can tell you he hasn't historically been well-liked. But even then, the reason he was ejected was because of this thing, not anything else, the way it's said. So he writes a letter asking Doug Ford to end the lockdowns. He makes some very good points. He cites some stats. He says basically that we are in a place in this province where the economic harm that is being caused by lockdown uh, cannot be ignored. We've got to open things up. Now, going after your party leader in a public way, I get it, not the best career move. But even so, Doug Ford is a leader who promised an open and transparent approach and discourse in his caucus. Roman is not in cabinet, was not in cabinet. So it's not like you have to have that cabinet solidarity. And within hours, he is out on the curb, done. Roman Baber kicked out of caucus for the crime of criticizing lockdowns and criticizing Doug Ford's uh, approach to this lockdown. So the thing that I find interesting is that there has been some vindication of this, a letter that came back from the former chief medical officer actually siding with Roman. Dr. Richard Shabas, who served as chief medical officer of health uh, up until 97, so again, quite a while ago, but still, said that Baber, quote, deserves great credit, unquote, for opening up the discussion on lockdowns. He said, this has never been part of pandemic response. It is not supported by science. And even recent studies show that the effectiveness has at most a small mortality benefit compared to more moderate measures. But both of these studies warned about the excessive cost of lockdowns. 
And if you look at the charts in Ontario and Quebec, for example, which have among the most uh, strict lockdowns in Canada, Quebec has a curfew, Ontario has a stay-at-home order, the lockdowns have not actually done all that much to so-called flatten the curve. Whereas you look at Alberta, which put in a, a more modest set of restrictions in December, uh, they actually peaked in December. And we hope it continues to go that way, but Alberta has continued to be on the decline while Ontario and Quebec continue to rise. Now, there are population differences, there are a number of demographic differences in the province, but if you just look at trend lines, the, lo the severe lockdowns of Ontario and Quebec did not stop because we are weeks into this now, did not stop the actual line from going in the direction it was headed when the lockdowns were supposedly justified by government. So Roman Baber is right to point this out. Any MPP is right to point this out, that, hey, the lockdowns aren't working, but what they are doing is causing all of these other businesses to go into sharp and steep decline, and then he's gone. He's out. He's out of caucus for this. Now, I ran in 2018. I could have been a member of this caucus and I've never been so grateful for a failure than I have been about this because I could not, and I've said this on the show, I could not sell what is being sold to Ontarians as a cure for the pandemic. I just couldn't. And I have a lot of respect for MPPs that are standing up or any members of government in Canada that are standing up and saying, you know what? We have to say stop. It's gone on long enough. Enough is enough. And this is not the way that you save a population. And I know that Alberta has been criticized by a lot of people by putting in very severe restrictions in, in some ways on the social interaction stuff. But at the same time, the business restrictions, which has been where my focus has mostly been, have been more lax in Alberta than elsewhere. And you should say that because businesses have been allowed by and large to stay open with reduced capacity as opposed to shutting down altogether. Now, uh, Alberta went too far, I think, by shutting down personal care services. Those are, are starting to come back. It's not perfect. I'm not saying that Alberta is the model that we all want to copy here, but I'm saying that if you stack up all the different provinces and their responses, Alberta is one of the better ones. And I actually talked about this briefly with Jason Kenney this week. He did a press conference and I asked about this. I said, hang on, I, we've seen the trend lines. What is it that Alberta is doing that other provinces could do themselves? Or is it just a, a distinctly Albertan phenomenon? what's happening. This is what he said. Next is Andrew Lawton with True North. Go ahead, Andrew. Good morning, Green Mayor. Turning to COVID-19, in Ontario and Quebec, where they have very strict lockdowns, we are seeing a continued rise in cases where, contrasting with Alberta, which had a, a much a less severe set of restrictions, we saw a peak in December that seems to be, we certainly hope, uh, continuing to be on the decline. I'm curious if you can comment uh, as to why you think that is and what there might be in Alberta's approach that could be replicated in other parts of the country. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Well, I, I, you know, you can have all the rules in the world, but it doesn't matter if people don't comply with them. And our take on this is that if you uh, put people on sort of indefinite lockdown, uh, there is only so much public patience to respect and comply with rules like that. One of the reasons we have looked at restrictions as a last and limited resort is, uh, so, is to maintain public compliance with those guidelines and restrictions um, so that people uh, buy into them and, and hopefully they can be shorter in duration uh, and, and, and therefore it, uh, less destructive in terms of their social and economic impact. So I know we've been heavily criticized by some for looking at restrictions not as a first choice, but as a last and limited resort. But I think it's it has served Alberta reasonably well, uh, the approach that we have taken. We began uh, relaxation of the current set of restrictions. In fact, we will begin that this week uh, with some activities. And we will continue to take a careful approach gradually to relaxing those restrictions uh, as long as we continue to see the numbers go in the right direction. I'll remind you, I know there's still there are a lot of Albertans who are understandably frustrated with the restrictions that we currently have. And they often ask me, you know, what's the goal here? Uh, and uh, let me restate that goal. The goal is to protect lives 
and livelihoods. More specifically in Alberta, the goal is to control viral spread so that it does not overwhelm the healthcare system while minimizing the damage of restrictions on our broader social and economic health. That has always been, our goal has never been to chase after zero. Our goal has never been to eliminate risk because we believe that's a fool's errand in this context, but rather to manage risk. And I, I, I want to thank Albertans. There was some poll a couple of weeks ago that said Albertans had the highest level of um, not socializing over the Christmas holidays. So that's the, the kind of buy-in that I'm talking about. Um, I was ridiculed by political opponents in the fall for talking about the importance of personal and collective responsibility. This is exactly what I'm talking about. At the end of the day, you can have all the restrictions in the world, try to shut things down, but if people don't respect them, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so I want to thank Albertans for respecting uh, the public health guidance as we continue to see the numbers go in the right direction right now. Our goal has never been to chase after zero. Our goal has never been to eliminate risk because we believe that's a fool's errand in this context, but rather to manage risk. A very important message there from Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. We've got to take a break. We'll be back with more of The Andrew Lawton Show in just a moment. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. I'm going to be speaking about freedom of expression and free speech later on in the show, but I, I wanted to do a bit of a recall of a topic I addressed on the show last week, which was the Liberal government still deciding to steamroll ahead with a plan to regulate social media content. And we have a little bit more information about this now than we did last week. There was a story in the Globe and Mail that had some government sources that were uh, speaking about it, and this is actually far worse than I could have imagined for a few reasons. And just the refresher on this is that the government wants to put in legislation that's going to force social media companies to censor user content or if they don't regulate them, fine them, penalize them in some way. So the problem with this is that if you think big tech censorship is bad and you think government censorship is bad, this is government-empowered big tech censorship, which means that big tech is the one dropping the hammer, but government's the rationale behind it. But because it's being done by a private company, you can't actually appeal it. There's no due process. You can't really challenge it. And companies like Facebook and Twitter that don't want to be fined or penalized by the government are just going to have a very broad interpretation of what they have to get rid of. So you have a, a liberal government that wants to go after online hate, despite the fact that hate speech is already illegal, and they haven't actually defined what else they want to prohibit beyond that. So if you were around when the Canadian Human Rights Commission was prosecuting people under Section 13, it was basically the thought crime provision of Canadian human rights law, you'll know why this is such a dangerous area for government to be involved in. But this Globe and Mail story has some more details, one in particular that jumps out. The Canadian legislation could be introduced in Parliament as soon as February or March. It's expected to be influenced by measures already in place in other countries, such as Germany, which requires social media platforms to remove illegal content under tight deadlines and the threat of financial penalties. In a Canadian context, this will likely involve the creation of a new government regulator. So not only do we have government going after your speech, but we also have government creating a new bureaucracy in the process, which is the one thing no government ever needs more of. More regulators, more agencies, more bureaucrats. So not only are we going to have online censorship, uh, thanks to the government, but we're also going to have government spending, which is just like adding insult to injury and the icing on the cake, as they say. Uh, this is a story that I just want to touch on very briefly that shows the absurdity of the era in which we live. Hells Angels affiliated members pick up over $32,000 in fines for illegally gathering in January. This is in Montreal, where officers in Quebec's provincial police's organized crime squad have broken up gatherings of people affiliated with the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, and they haven't gotten them on drug trafficking or human trafficking or any of the other litany of crimes the biker gangs are involved in, but they've gotten them on violating the COVID-19 restrictions. This is like the modern equivalent of 
of getting Al Capone on tax evasion, I think. It reminds me of that story back in, I think, April when a Hamilton drug dealer was busted for running a non-essential business during the COVID lockdown. So this is this is what it's come to now. They're getting the biker gangs on violating lockdowns, violating curfew, not on, you know, the other illegal stuff. Oh boy. We've got to take a break when we come back talking about the financial benefit of free speech here on The Andrew Lawton Show. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. We often talk about free speech and press freedom as being important on their own. They're important because they're values of liberty that we all treasure. But it turns out there may be an economic argument for them as well. A new report from the Montreal Economic Institute says that you could actually end up with more money. The average Canadian could be richer by $2,552 annually if Canada had more freedom of expression. We'll talk about how we get to that number with Maria Lily Shaw, who's an economist with the Montreal Economic Institute and one of the co-authors of Canada Must Do More to Protect and Encourage Freedom of Expression. Maria, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So this is an interesting one. And when I first saw the headline, I admittedly was curious about how we get there. You actually looked at a a whole bunch of countries all around the world and and found that you could actually draw a line between more money in people's pockets and more press freedom. How is that? Exactly. Well, as you know, freedom of expression is extremely important in democratic societies like ours. Canada ranks fairly well internationally. We're in the top 20, according to the independent analysis that we looked at. But we know we can do better. So, and frankly, it's hard not to feel like we're losing ground when we see the climate of censorship that's taking hold of our universities and the general public. Mm -hmm. So in light of this, we asked ourselves if there was an economic angle that could be interesting, that we could explore, that would allow us to truly display the clear link between freedom of speech and economic growth. So surely enough, by doing the math, we were able to estimate that Canada's GDP per person, like you said, could increase by over $2,500 if we defended freedom of speech as well as the number one country does on our ranking. And right now, the number one country is Norway. So what is it that Norway does differently than Canada? Or did you not go down into that depth? Because I know it's difficult when you are looking at, at so many different countries. No, we did actually ask ourselves what Norway does differently than us. And Well, the Norwegians basically made it a priority to strengthen their freedom of expression in tangible ways. So it's standard practice for politicians in Norway to make constant efforts to better protect their freedom of expression. And just a few years ago, the country armed itself with an action plan to better promote media independence and increase government transparency. And by comparison, Canada is doing less and less to fight censorship as we see the government can arbitrarily subsidize one media outlet rather than the other, which can undermine media independence and make the information less reliable or biased. So, and that's not to mention that it's increasingly difficult to get information from our governments right now. Mm -hmm. And these examples are only part of the differences that exist between uh, Canada and Norway right now. And you've actually used as, as a proxy here, media freedom for broader freedom of expression, correct? Yeah, exactly. Because when we talk about freedom of speech, it's actually very closely linked to the freedom of the press. So there are also other criteria that we have to consider, such as government transparency, media independence, violence towards the press as well. Mm -hmm. So when we say we want to improve freedom of expression, we actually want to encourage an environment or, or an infrastructure that facilitates the production and dissemination of news and information. How do we know that this isn't just an issue of the countries that are very much open to press freedom are also doing other things? They're predisposed to other things that are causing that economic uh, growth. How can we draw the line between the two? It's hard to know. You're right. But when we did look at the overall picture of our sample, which included over 130 countries, When we looked at those who ranked the lowest, meaning those who have a very weak performance in terms of freedom of speech, they're often authoritarian countries, of course, but they're also those who have the lowest GDP per capita. Hmm. And so those, the population in those countries not only suffer from poor economic conditions, but they also have very high unemployment, very high infant mortality rates and a low GDP. So that's where we basically drew the line. 
Yeah, and this is actually coming at a, a really important point. We talked about this on the show mm. last week, that the Canadian government is looking at even more uh, restrictions. So not going the direction that you're saying we should go, but the opposite way on online freedom of expression, which we know is uh, potentially a recipe for disaster. In fact, I, I don't see how it can be anything but that. So uh, it does seem like we're backsliding here. Exactly. And what appears to be, let's say, unusual is that now it's the younger generation that seems to want to censor the older generation, or let's say it's the students that are kind of standing mm -hmm. up and saying what they don't like or what they, they don't like what they're hearing. And when it goes that way, it's kind of worrisome because there are grave consequences when it comes to the, the climate of censorship, like I said, that's taking hold of our universities. And the example of the GDP per capita is only one example of what we're losing by not protecting it more. So yeah, no and it's important to, to note that while you have quantified the benefit uh, in this, if we were to go down a road of, of having more press freedom, there would also be a better human freedom, which is not as easily quantifiable, but there are other benefits to living in a freer country. Of course. Like uh, like I said earlier, Norway, Norway making it a priority. Mm -hmm. The fact that the politicians are making a constant effort to better protect their freedom of expression means that the citizens can also speak out and say what they like and what they don't like. So the policies that they come out with are, by default, better adapted to what their population wants. So that's another way to see how our standard of life is also at stake here with the censorship. Now, what are some of the tangibles that you've included that you think would actually get us on that road to having more press freedom and, and thus having that uh, more uh, $2,500 more in our uh, pockets? <laughs> Well, we put forward three concrete recommendations that could improve our freedom of speech and therefore improve our standard of living. Mm -hmm. And the first being a, uh, to create a regulatory and fiscal framework that's favorable to all media rather than just dishing out subsidies rather randomly to one or the other. The second being to encourage universities to promote freedom of expression in order to allow their faculty and their students to speak freely without fear of repercussion. And the last one is to increase transparency by reducing the need to make requests for access to information. Yeah, and the last one isn't the the sexiest of topics, but it, it is a significant issue. I mean, I, any journalist I know, certainly any independent journalist, and I include myself in this category, has had access to information requests that have, in, in some cases, taken years, and some departments are, are notoriously bad about this, like the RCMP. But it, it's very difficult to hold a government to account when the government is saying, no, we're very open, we have access to information, but in practice, that isn't actually working. Exactly. And it has happened to us in the past. I mean, in June, we did make a request for access to information and we haven't had a response. All we mm -hmm. had are emails saying, OK, the response will be delayed, but we've never actually gotten our answer. So it, it has happened to us as well. And I can't imagine the number of journalists that have done the same and that have mm -hmm. gone without answer as well for all these months at a time. There is a delay that the government is supposed to respect. If I'm not mistaken, it's three months. Forgive me if I'm wrong. But still, in any case, they have surpassed this delay by many, many months. Yeah, and the university aspect is an important one as well. Uh, we saw in Ontario the uh, new government, well, it's not new anymore, but at the time in 2018, the new conservative government put in a policy that said any uh, university that didn't have a uh, statement that was affirming freedom of expression could be regulated and, and could have their funding affected, and that never ended up happening. I mean, universities put it forward, but we still have stories of university censorship, so there hasn't actually mm. been a firm policy that does what you're recommending, which is actually seriously promote and, and protect what are supposed to be inalienable rights on publicly funded campuses. Exactly. And the controversy at the University of Ottawa is just one example. It's a very sad example, but still, as you said, there's no very clear and concrete policy that has been put into place that is easy to respect and enforce. Uh, so we're kind of still waiting on, on that to see if the government has any other moves up, to, up its sleeve. Uh, we hope so, because if there isn't freedom of expression in universities, I'm, I'm afraid of where we're going, because that's where the ideas are supposed to flow. That's where innovation is supposed to happen. Very much so. I'm just curious, Maria, when you set out on this study with your uh, colleague, did you expect that you'd find such a, a decisive number? Did you expect that there would be such a, a visible difference between less free countries and, and more free countries on this economic criterion? Well, 
we didn't really know what to expect. We were very glad to see that the number was interesting. We wanted this uh, this piece to 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 interest many people. Um, the twenty five hundred dollars per person was something we were quite excited about, and the fact that we can actually present this and say, you know, there's concrete ways to increase our standard of living if we at least make it easier to uh, to, to to say our ideas in public or in school. So our expectations were low in the sense that we didn't have any, <laughs> but we were hoping to find something very interesting. And the $2,500 uh, per year is actually for every ranking we go up. So let's say right now we're in 18th position. If we were to become the 17th country on that list, we would gain $150 per person per year. So it's every time we go up a place, we gain something. So even the smallest detail, even the smallest little policy could make a difference for every do, Canadian. Do we find that freedoms tend to go hand in hand, that countries that are better on press freedom are better on economic freedom, are better on other forms of, of liberty? Yeah, well, just as the lowest ranking countries had a very poor economic condition and a high, high unemployment rate and infant mortality rates, it was kind of the opposite for those who had a very high ranking um, mm. in terms of freedom of expression. So they had very high GDP. Um, the uh, the education level was higher as well. Their unemployment was lower. Um, and this was before COVID, the, the information was taken. So. Oh, very interesting. Well, again, I mean, we've covered media freedom a great deal on this show and will continue to. And it's good to know there's a, an economic basis for wanting more of it as well. Maria Lily Shaw, one of the co-authors of this report with the Montreal Economic Institute. It is called Canada Must Do More to Protect and Encourage Freedom of Expression. Maria, thank you so much for coming on. Really fascinating. Thank you so much. This is great. I mean, it used to be, and I have made this comment on the show in the past, that people had enough of an appreciation for free speech that if you could say to them, well, that would actually challenge free speech, they would say, oh, well, you're right, therefore I don't like it. Whereas now, I mean, free speech is a tool of the patriarchy, it's white supremacist, it's privileged, it's all of that. So you can't even really deal in facts in some cases. Now, it stands to reason that people who don't care about the facts on one level probably won't care about an economic argument because, you know, the, the well, you know how the left is on economics, but and <laughs> it's a whole topic for another show. But it is interesting that, you know, countries can take a step forward because a lot of these would not cost anything. I mean, you could reform access to information by maybe spending a little bit more to have better resource departments, but we're not talking about billions of dollars here. And this would make Canada more free. You can actually save money by taking the funding away from public universities that don't respect free speech and you either save money or you just gain more freedom and spend the same amount again something you could do so a lot of these things are not economically restricted but are really coming down to a lack of willpower so i would love to see a federal provincial even municipal governments say you know what free speech is important it is and now it would make canadians a bit more money so that's even better the icing on the cake as they say my thanks again to maria lily shaw and the montreal economic institute we'll be back in just a couple of days with more of canada's most irreverent talk show here on true north thank you god bless and good day canada Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.